Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. To all who shall see these presents, greetings. On behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast. Our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Nate Kiwi Janikin, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the United States government. We will also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who were not able to join us today. So we ask that you keep your own webcams off to help us stream smoothly. This episode is going to depart a little bit from our normal programming. Instead, we're going to have a conversation with our guests. I have a few conversation prompts based on our topic of leadership that I will start with, but whenever you have a question, just type it in the group chat and I'll go through them in the order received. Typically, this is where I would say something remotely profound. Uh, usually I black out and then come to after I say something somewhat smart uh, in order to lead into our topic and, and also give a small background about our guest. Instead, we're going to let them, uh, we're going to let all of that kind of play out over the course of our conversation as we talk about leadership. Our title is Leadership from the Perspective of a Communications Officer. So via the clues, we can establish that our guest, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Arun Shankar, is a communications officer by trade, but he's also a graduate of SAW and he's held command at the company and battalion levels. So welcome, sir. Uh, I wanted to use this opportunity to build some background and conversation because I believe that um, our experiences and relationships kind of build us as leaders and it might provide the audience with some context uh, behind our own statements. So we'll start with, you know, what could be an easy one or a hard one, who knows? Uh, when and why did you decide to uh, join the Marine Corps and what's your career path been like up to today? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Kiwi. First of all, before I answer that question, I just want to thank you, Kulak Center, and, and everyone for allowing me to be uh, online today and speak about my experiences. I hope they're they're useful to somebody out there. Um, but but I'm, I'm really uh, honored to, to have this opportunity, so thank you. So I was uh, commissioned as second lieutenant in the Marine Corps on July 15th, 2002. And that was just nine months after the September 11th attacks, which is what inspired me to join the Marine Corps. On September 11th, I had already done uh, the first half of OCS PLC juniors, and, and I, I was already in the program, but you know, I'm not sure I was quite sure about what I wanted to do. Uh, but after that day, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a Marine. A Marine officer, and uh, and I, and I wanted to do this job for for as long as I possibly could, and 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 that's still my my uh, desire and stance uh, today as a Marine officer, and you know it's fitting today is September 11th, and uh, I'm proud to be able to do this podcast on this very meaningful day in American history, and uh, so I've I've been a communications officer. Most recently, I served in First Marine Division. Uh, as a G6, this was a few years back now, and uh, and after that, I was a CO at Communications Training Battalion, which is the 06XX uh, training schoolhouse there, and had the had the outstanding op opportunity of being CO in the the best schoolhouse in the Marine Corps, in my opinion. Uh, and I've also had the opportunity to be an Ops Research Analyst, which is the one of those MOSs on NPS payback in, in both OIF and OEF. Uh, as well as an 0505 operational planner at uh, the MAGTAF staff training program. So I've had, I've had a variety of, of outstanding opportunities as a Marine officer, and, and, and I look forward to more of them as, as the years come. So basically, you've had, you know, platoon all the way up to battalion with that battalion level sort of being the, the schoolhouse then. Yes, absolutely. And, and totally just had the best Marines around me for, for all 21 years of my career. Sure. Yeah, I think it'd be hard to find somebody who, who didn't have command somewhere that wouldn't say the same thing about uh, their units as well. And then just to provide some, you know, the contrast on the other side. So from my standpoint, so uh, May 27th, 2005, I was commissioned. Uh, I went to the Naval Academy. So, you know, 9-11, uh, I was walking to a uh, chemistry class and somebody said, hey, the Pentagon's on fire. So I thought in my head, you know, some idiot had set like a trash can on fire. Uh, and then about halfway through the class, they told everybody, hey, just put your stuff down. Don't worry about what it is. Just walk back to your room. Uh, and that's when, you know, we found out about, you know, the attacks there on 9-11. So we were kind of the, the, you know, we were there for the whole four years, um, you know, post 9-11, you know, 
so it was an interesting time to be at the Naval Academy then, and then uh, commissioned into the uh, Marine Corps, obviously, went to flight school, uh, flew 46s out in Okinawa, uh, so deployed on multiple 31st Mews uh, with uh, 46s, and then transitioned over to, to Hueys and then flew uh, with HMLA doing a 15th Mew uh, and some other stuff on the West Coast. So uh, that's kind of been my experience, and you know, all of my fleet time essentially has been at the squadron level. Um, and then I spent some time at MSTP as well as the aviation OTC. So uh, we've got that going for us uh, and we'll go from there. So, um, you know, when we spoke on the phone, we, you know, we, we very specifically titled this episode, uh, leadership from the perspective of a communications officer. And one of the things that we had talked about is, you know, leadership for, uh, technical MOSs, but then you and I had both agreed that that probably wasn't the best. Uh, way to title it, because um, well, one, I don't want Lieutenant Colonel Horde coming out of nowhere and just sucker punching me in the face, uh, you know, saying that hey, infantry guys don't have uh, technical MOSs with all the, you know, the small UASs and stuff like that. So that's why we kind of shied away from that, because there are MOSs uh, that are getting very highly technical that weren't, you know, considered technical in the past. Um, so how do you think your leadership experience has been different? Uh, because of, you know, being a communications officer and not, you know, something else? Yeah, that, that's a great question, uh, Kiwi, and I appreciate it. Um, so I'll just start by saying, you know, leadership fundamentally at, at its core is, is the same, I think, for, for most of us. Uh, it's about inspiring people to do things largely that they otherwise wouldn't want to do and creating a culture that defines excellence as the norm and then inspecting and assessing to ensure that your unit is accomplishing the mission. So I think those are those are fundamental things, all commanders at every level and, and the, even the shop leaders and, and everyone else, that, that's what we do. But in in communications, it's uh, there's there's some peculiar challenges because, uh, because the MLS is constantly changing. I don't think there's an MLS like this uh, anywhere else in the Marine Corps where you can be trained on some skills and then three years from now they they can largely atrophy to, not atrophy, but become uh, irrelevant if you're not uh, staying updated with new technology, new equipment, and, and new ways of doing things. Uh, at the comm schoolhouse, when, when, I was, uh, when I was working there as a CEO, we tried to focus largely on uh, teaching Marines basic fundamentals and teaching them more how to think than what to think because of this uh, dilemma of, of the MOS uh, technology changing constantly. Uh, and we also see this challenge when when staff and COs uh, get sent to uh, SDA billets and they come back after three or four years from recruiting or drill instructor duty MSG, and uh, and they don't they don't uh, the, the MOS has changed and they they have to go be retrained to to be the confident leaders that they, that they once were, and and I think we see that with with officers as well to an extent though we don't have as much of a hands on role uh, as the enlisted Marines do, and so. Uh, the challenge is it comes down to how do you focus on keeping uh, training Marines to to be Marines, traditional riflemen, um, uh, the whole Marine concept, the discipline, everything that goes with with being uh, in the military, in addition to training them on this very very difficult skill set that is that is changing all the time, um, and then. Uh, the MOS, by the way, is the foundation of, of all command and control in the Marine Corps, just about. And so when it if it doesn't work, if equipment doesn't work or or systems aren't working the way users expect, uh, it, it's it, it's a big detriment. Uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's not it's not some simple issue uh, that we can just sweep under the rug and say, well, a, a B is good enough. A comm has to work or, or commanders can't fight. And so uh, so it's tough. And um, but I think that. At the end of the day, if you're focused on short term wins, like just trying to survive the next exercise or just trying to get through the next backyard op uh, and putting your, your smartest guy on the gear and crossing your fingers and hoping you can get through it, that's otherwise known as toxic leadership. I mean, you read any leadership book, that, that's what toxic leadership is. It's, it's not really caring about developing your people or your unit for the long term. It's just about survival till tomorrow. And it's easy to get into that when you're when you're a comm guy, uh, because because comm is is is, is difficult to, uh, to 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 get uh, to achieve success in sometimes. But I think if you focus on uh, 
what 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 we learned in in our in our basics at the basic school on uh, on teaching Marines to the dis the discipline and the war fighting skills that come with that, and remind them why they're Marines every day, uh, as well as focus on the technical training. You, you get a better outcome, but it, there's nothing easy about that. Yeah, I think you know when we spoke previously, you and I, you know, we had talked about you know sometimes it can be hard to balance the things you have to do for the MOS uh, with the things you have to do in order to be a Marine. And I, I sort of equated it to, you know, you don't, in the recruiting commercials, you don't see somebody sweeping up the barracks. You don't see the, the communications Marine in the background, making sure the radios work. Uh, you don't see the avionics men, you know, shooting wires in a Huey or, you know, a 53 or a V-22. You know, what you see is you see guys running off the back of an AAV, you see Cobras flying overhead, you see, you know, ships in the background and stuff launching off of them. You know, you see the, the cool stuff, but you don't see all the work that goes behind all that cool stuff happening. And that, that work in the background, it, it's a lot of work. And so, you know, it, it, it can be hard. And we're going to talk a little bit later about, you know, sustain, maintaining and and sustaining that transformation. But I think, you know, that's a little bit, you know, you made the comment that leadership is all the same. Uh, and, and I do agree, you know, we're, we're trying to get to the same ends. Uh, but I think from my standpoint, I, I think, you know, my leadership experience has been uh, vastly different, I think, than a lot of my peers who are not in aviation units, uh, just by the very nature of, of how, you know, my particular MOS uh, worked. And so, you know, I think our ends are the same, but our our ways and our means. Maybe our ways and our means are different. Ends, ways, and means. Yeah, I, I, that that's 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 a good way of putting it, Q. I like that uh, using an, an operational approach to describe uh, describe how we do how we do leadership. Um, but you know, let me let me go back to one thing here. So, if if you only focus on the MOS skills and and you, you discard the traditions and culture and and discipline that traditionally defines Marines. Uh, I, I personally think, and this is from my, my experience of, of absorbing, observing and, and leading Marines now for over two decades, uh, you are likely, they likely aren't benefiting from the uh, intangible growth and camaraderie that, that defines Marines. And you might say, maybe that's okay if, if, if you just want these technical skills to, to emerge, but, but eventually, those Marines don't want to stick around anymore in, in, in what I've seen. Um, I, I uh, sadly have have done uh, far too many e EAS interviews in my career. And uh, oftentimes when a tier one Marine comes to me and, and wants to EAS, and this is this is more often than I want to be proud of, um, they'll tell me it's it's because I didn't get the tough, rugged, hard military experience that I signed up for. I mean, that's the most common thing I hear from tier one Marines that are getting out. Uh, this isn't what I expected. This isn't what the recruiter told me I was going to get. And it's never like, you know, I was expecting a three day work week and I was expecting a lot of time off. It was, I was expecting to get my butt kicked. And, uh, and I didn't, I don't know if I necessarily got that out of this experience. So, uh, Thanks, but no thanks. And I, and I, I feel so, so bad to see that and hear that sometimes. So, so I believe in my mind that uh, every Marine deserves the full Marine Corps experience, no matter what MOS they are. And, uh, and that's how you build camaraderie, teamwork, and a unit that is ready for a near peer fight. You know, going back to the analogy of, you know, what's the things we see in the recruiting commercials? You know, if you're able to help Marines kind of do those things, like those are the reasons why they they join the Marine Corps is because of the things they see. I mean, for me personally, I chose 46s because in my mind's eye, Marine Corps aviation was 46s landing in hot zones in Vietnam. Like that was my vision of what Marine Corps aviation was. And so that's why I chose that platform. So I think you're right. Like, you know, we, we've got to make concessions, even though, you know, from a wing standpoint, you know, fix and fly aircraft was kind of the the mission. You know, at least from a you know the maintenance standpoint. But you know, the the squadron's mission was you know different than that. It was you know provide fires to the MAGTAF commander or provide aerial transport to the MAGTAF commander. But it's hard for maintainers, you know, those junior Marines to see that sometimes. And so you have to figure out ways to show those Marines 
you know, what that experience can be like and, and, and let them play out that, you know, show them that, that their job is important. And I think that kind of goes into that leadership is, is how do we do that? Um, and then just for the benefit of those who might not be Marines, could you, uh, you know, explain what a, a tier one Marine is? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry for that. Um, so when, when Marines are, are coming up for reenlistment after their uh, four or five year contract, they get binned in, in tiers, either one, two, three, or four. And these tiers are based on uh, some performance attributes that they have, their physical fitness scores, they, they, uh, courses that they've taken, their proficiency in their MOS, um, their rifle scores, their pistol scores, if they have them. Uh, things like that go into this uh, calculation of a tier. And, and tier one Marines are typically the top 10% of those reenlisting in a particular MOS. And so we want to retain those folks. We want to retain everybody if we can, but uh, our, our tier one Marines are, are certainly folks we want to focus on and keep around. And, and we, you know, like I said before, giving them the best, uh, the best Marine Corps opportunity in their first four years is, is what most of them desire to want to reenlist. So we owe them that. Uh, so we'll shift back to kind of your experience of, uh, so you've had company command leadership up to battalion level. So what, you know, what leadership, what leadership aspects or styles did you have to, you know, did you make adjustments going from company command and battalion command and how would you compare and contrast the two? Yeah, th thanks for that question too, Q. That's, that's a, that's a good one. It's one I'm, I'm very passionate about. Uh, so I had, a, I had a great opportunity of, of being a company commander twice, once at, at first MLG communications company and once at first Marine division communications company. These are you know, two of the largest communications companies, maybe the two of the largest operational companies in the Marine Corps. So I was, uh, I, they were awesome. And I, I had some of the best Marines I've ever met in my life uh, in those two units. But uh, while I was a company commander, um, I, I have never been, um, you know, closer to Marines than at that level, maybe as a platoon commander. I, I don't know if I count that as traditional command, uh, but as, as a company commander, uh, you really, really got to know my Marines. I, I, they got to know me and, and, and through that establishing trust was pretty easy. Um, understanding each other was, was pretty simple and implicit communication was, was not an issue really at all. Um, and that, that, that makes company command, uh, in my opinion, the most rewarding of the two commands, the two types of command that I've had. Uh, but on the flip side, it's, it's also you know, a, a lot of hard work and and a lot of attention to detail and, and a lot of energy, far more energy than I put into battalion command. Um, and in a company command, as you know, the most of the Marines are first term Marines, and that includes the officers. Uh, most of the folks in there to have less than four years experience. And so there is a there's a ramp up to getting uh, those folks bought into the Marine Corps mission, uh, into to what the Marine Corps is all about, uh, discipline. You know, I'll be I'll be honest. When you're when you're 21, 22 years old, or 18 years old, uh, discipline is is kind of interesting, and and you feel good about it when you're going through it. But you don't always understand the full meaning of it and purpose of it till you till you're much older. And I I can honestly say that about myself as well. Uh, but so, so trying to teach those those fundamental concepts to young Marines, uh, and and so many of them, there's you know there's 250 of them, and there's probably four or five Marines in the command that have over 10 years experience in the Marine Corps, uh, and me being a major, I, I think honestly, other than the master guns, I had the most experience in the Marine Corps in, in both of those companies, uh, maybe maybe the first sergeant as well, uh, and so it 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 that's that's a challenge. That's a challenge to get those Marines to, to buy into to what's going on and and convince them of, of uh, how everything that we do leads to the end state of greater war fighting. At battalion level, uh, I had the great opportunity of having five of the best majors I've ever served with surrounding me, two great first sergeants and, and a master gunnery sergeant. And these were the people that I uh, spoke to and, and worked with directly every day. Uh, and and so when you're when you're working with a group like that, your problems that you're dealing with are obviously much tougher. I believe the O5 commanders own most of the risk in the Marine Corps, and and so what you're trying to deal with every day at that level is managing risk, and 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 establishing culture. 
And those aren't easy tasks at all. But working with those Marines that have, you know, have 15 plus, 20 plus, and in the case of my master gunning, almost 30 years experience in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, as long as I'm not doing anything immoral or unethical, uh, they're bought in to what we're trying to do every single day. And it's, it's, it's actually quite simple and refreshing to, uh, to, to pass along that kind of guidance. And it's also, uh, you get a lot of really good feedback from that, those uh, elite uh, veteran Marines that, that have, have lived life and, and done almost as much as, as, as I had in many cases, and in many cases more than what I had. And, uh, and so getting that kind of uh, feedback and uh, advice from them uh, is really kind of a, a, almost like PME every day coming to work. And I, so it was, it was different, the O5 level, uh, different kinds of challenges, but, but overall, um, I found company command to be the most rewarding and, and also the, the, the hardest. And then at the battalion command, you know, schoolhouse, you had mentioned, so how did your, you know, I'm sure you were able to talk with some of your, the other tank commanders for the other comm battalions. You know, how did your, how do you think your experience differed from them, uh, you know, being in an operational unit and you being a schoolhouse unit, you know, what do you, you know, compare, I don't think I, you know, I couldn't, I can't ask you to compare and contrast because, you know, your experience is, is probably different, but in what ways was your experience different uh, being at a schoolhouse vice, uh, you know, operational battalion? Yeah, that's a good question too. So I can only speak uh, from uh, what operational battalion goes to based on my, my outside observation of them. I've never been a operational battalion commander and, uh, and, and my peers that have are, are absolutely outstanding human beings. Um, but in my observation, I think the main difference from a commander's perspective is in a schoolhouse, the population changes out about once every 90 days. And it, and it at times approached almost 2,000 Marines. Comp Training Battalion is the largest MOS uh, schoolhouse in the Marine Corps. And uh, so you've got 2,000 Marines, sometimes a, maybe maybe a, a, when, when it's lower, maybe 1,000 Marines, but changing out every 90 days, establishing culture can be difficult. It's, it's burning in a culture can be difficult. And so you're, you're uh, in my case, I was very uh, reliant obviously on my company commanders and my instructor staff to to burn in that culture for me and then they did they did a tremendous job I, i've honestly never seen uh sergeants and staff sergeants work as hard as those young marines did to maintain one of the finest cultures i've ever seen in an organization uh, and, and they did it all with with just an ask that's all i ever did was ask them can you do this for me and and they and they did it and they did it better than I've ever seen in my life. So, uh, but that that's the trick I think is getting that small cohort of instructors, which is less than 150 Marines, to uh, to manage the other 1,900 PFCs, and and uh, and get them to buy into what we're trying to do in that schoolhouse every day. Um, and I think that's a little different than than an operation. With, with that culture, knowing that, you know, if you were changing out every 90 days and those PSCs and Lance Corporals were going to, you know, immediately go from there to some comm unit somewhere, you know, were, did you ever have discussions with some of the other comm unit commanders about, you know, what kind of culture they wanted to set in their own unit so that you could maybe, you know, help establish some of that baseline? Or was this simply, you know, hey, this is my theory of, of command, you know, how I want to lead. And so this is the culture I'm going to build here. You know. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Kiwi. So um, part of it is, uh, you know, what my vision of, of what I would have wanted to receive uh, when I was a company commander. Uh, but a lot of it was feedback from commanders in the fleet. And my team and I would, would visit uh, big box comm units at least once every couple of months, we would, we would drive up to one MEF or fly to two MEF or, or talk to three MEF virtually uh, about their expectations of, of what they wanted from our comm school and our, and our young Marines that are graduating uh, and take specific notes on that so that they understood it. I think it obviously went without saying that they wanted uh, disciplined Marines that, uh, that, that were ready to be Marines and, and were looking forward to their next four years in the Marine Corps. Uh, but they also wanted proficient Marines that they could put on gear immediately as soon as they got to their units and 
and add some value in, in a field exercise or something like that. And uh, and so, you know, those are those are basic expectations, but but they're important expectations. And I think if you if you aren't getting the feedback from the fleet and those commanders, uh, you're probably not doing your job uh, in the schoolhouse. Yeah, I think this leads back to the comment I made earlier about, you know, I, I think my my the ways and means that I got to the ends of our, you know, the you know, what is leadership and, and it is it different? Is it not different? You know, and I think you know, your description of company command and battalion command, you know, this is where I sort of view it, at least from my time as a as an aviator, I, I view it differently. So, you know, the squadron level, that's our battalion. Uh, but we don't have company command or platoon command within the within the squadron. So, you know, we have work centers downstairs. Each work center has a very specific job. So, you know, you'll have the avionics work center, the ordnance work center, and they they fix and repair very specific things on the helicopter. So each one of those work centers is going to have an OIC. There's an officer there. But your main role is that OIC is not necessarily to lead that work center. You have staff and COs that are going to do that. You know, your main job is still you know, 7562, 46 pilot or 7563 Huey pilot. And so that's your main goal, especially as a, as a young lieutenant, a young captain, you know, your, your role in the squadron is to learn how to fly and fight your platform. Um, so, and, and not everybody can go, you know, we, at least in the HMLA and the 46, it's the downstairs Marines because the, the squadron's typically two floors. And so you'll have the S shops upstairs and you'll have the maintainers downstairs. And so we have upstairs Marines and downstairs Marines. If you are an officer that just happens to always be in an S shop, there's a distinct possibility that you could be a major, even a Lieutenant Colonel, uh, and really only been in charge of a shop that was three, four, five, maybe six Marines. You know, that is a vastly different experience than what you've had uh, with company command or even 150 people uh, in your battalion command. And so, you know, I, I was a very senior captain before I ever had a profile, you know, a fit rep profile for any rank. Uh, and I, and it, a meaning, meaningful profile I didn't have until I was a field grade officer. So that's where I'm kind of, that's where I differ a little bit in, you know, my leadership experience has been very different uh, than yours or any of my ground compatriots because of that. Um, and, and so I think it's just an interesting conversation to have because I don't I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, you know, we say swinging with the wing and we usually say it as a joke, but, you know, it's a very different experience sometimes uh, in the wing vice, uh, you know, what you see on the ground side. You, you know, Q, I'll, I'll add to that, though, um, your 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 ability to uh, lead at a very a specific and technical level. Uh, in 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 the aviation community is is, is unsurpassed. Uh, I've I've never seen anything better than it in the Marine Corps of pilots leading pilots, and leading aviation, leading aircraft maintenance objectives. You, you know you hear them speak in in the I think y'all call it the the war room or ward room or something like that. Uh, the, the the ready room. Ready room. There we go. I'm sorry. Yeah. I've I've heard I've heard pilots speak in there about uh, you know doing debriefs and things like that. Uh, that, that's that's not something that's in my capacity to to, to uh, understand uh, things at, at that uh, deep of a level in in uh, in, in any MOS that, that I've had. Uh, I've been I'm highly reliant on my Marines to uh, to achieve success in my unit, and so I've I've really tried to hone skills to 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 do that. Um, and and but you know I I can't do what you do, and and so I have great appreciation for it. So I think it's a great segue into kind of our, our next conversation in that, you know, we didn't get super deep into your background, but I know talking to you, you've spent uh, a lot of time um, with the with the division uh, and with infantry units. And so, you know, we're talking about technical billets and while you were filling a technical billet with the, the division, you know, do you think that your experience kind of, you know, being with the division helped or hindered you while you were, you know, in these leading these, you know, technical intensive uh, units and MOSs. So uh, I got a little bit of bias about that. I I, um, I have two tours in the GCE and and I love them both. Um, I've never done a tour in the ACE, and I've done one in the MLG, and I've done some deployments on a mess staff. Uh, so so the ACE I, I can't speak for. I'm not. Uh, Unfortunately, not familiar, but I'm familiar with the other three elements of the MACTEF. 
And, uh, and my time as a lieutenant in particular at 3rd Marine Regiment uh, years ago, I believe, uh, set the uh, foundation from my experience for the rest of my career. You know, GCE units are, are unique in a lot of ways, uh, three in particular. GCE battalions, uh, infantry battalions, are on a regular deployment rotation. Uh, an infantry battalion is almost guaranteed to go on a deployment at least once every two years, sometimes even once a year, depending on, on how high the tempo is. Uh, when they're in the field, uh, infantry battalions and artillery battalions maneuver constantly. They generally don't set up and just stay there. They're they're usually moving at least once every couple of days. Artillery G's could be, you know, once every couple of hours. Uh, they they move a lot, and uh, typically in a MAGTAF, uh, the GCE is the main effort. Now that's not always the case, and I understand that humanitarian MAGTAFs often uh, the MLGs in the lead. And in special uh, special purpose mag tasks, depending on what the mission, uh, the wing can be in the lead as well. But typically, what I've seen is GC is in the lead. So, you know, these three characteristics kind of create a culture there where there's a very clear and distinct real world purpose, uh, at least for communications marines and communications officers. Uh, we take our jobs very very seriously in the division, and uh, and it's because there's there's some pretty high consequences if we if we aren't doing our jobs right. Um, the, uh, the, the, I, the, the deal with the, uh, the battalions moving around when they're in the field really creates, uh, challenges for, for communications and calm on the move is the, is the toughest calm to calm architecture to develop, uh, maintain, execute, operate all that stuff. So, um, you know, rigorous planning, execution, re rehearsals, the importance of speed and tempo, uh, mobility. All that is are things uh, I learned in the GC as a lieutenant that have real effects on a battle space, and I think have made me a better communications officer in the long run. Uh, moreover, GC units are are often foot mobile. Uh, when they go on patrols and things, they 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 often do them on their feet, and so this um, they take communications folks with them, obviously, and this creates a necessity for physical fitness and rifle mills rifleman skills. Uh, that are essential for success in in all MOSs in the GC. So that's that experience as as a as a second lieutenant as a first lieutenant in uh, Third Marine Regiment really set the tone for my uh, belief structure in in how important it is to hone all the aspects of being a Marine, not just technical skills, because I believe those are are essential to uh, to war fighting success. And what kind of leadership challenges did you face? You know, you, you talked about, hey, you're, you have your comm Marines are with those GCE units moving. So you're not, you don't have direct, you know, contact with them necessarily where you can't just like reach out and grab them by the arm. But what kind of challenges did you have with, you know, your Marines kind of being all over the place? Yeah, so to dis distributed teams as a, as a comm officer is a, is, has been common for me no matter what element of MACTAF I've been in. But but in the division, you're right. Uh, you'll send Marines off on different detachments all the time to, to do things with the uh, division infantry units uh, when they're in the field and such. And it, it's it's never I never found it to really be of an issue. Uh, the culture in the GCE, at, at least when I, in the unit I was in, Third Marine Regiment, was so strong uh, and so demanding that uh, all Marines knew that if they were going to go on a detachment. Uh, they were going to they were going to do their jobs right and do it well, or there would be significant consequences for it. And they uh, they were generally very proud of what they do and uh, did a really great job whenever they were detached. But I'll add another note: um, fairness and inclusivity in in Third Marine Regiment was was amazing. Uh, and I think the reason it is is, is when you're focused on war fighting and you're focused on uh, you know the things that that lead directly to war fighting, where there's no ambiguity there. Uh, it truly creates a meritocracy where high performers can can emerge without controversy. And I think that that was just an awesome part about being in that unit. Everyone was on a level playing field. Uh, we cared about one thing, and that was being better war fighters every day. And if you were helping the unit be a better war fighter every day, you were added value to the unit you were you were a good marine and if you weren't you know you, you had some stuff to work on and it's pretty simple um i think uh when units are not laser focused on this one end state uh, that's oftentimes when there starts to become some ambiguity and uh 
in culture and climate, things like that, that that's unnecessary. And, and so I, uh, I found that, you know, focus on this and everything will work itself out. So would you, did you try and pull some of those lessons about the culture you had there at the regiment? Is that kind of where you pulled some of it from when the culture that you tried to build at, at comm school? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, third Marine regiment and, um, and even a couple of the deployments I've been on, uh, and really, I, I just, I just know when, when, when the unit is focused and, 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 and the Marines clearly understand their purpose and, and the purpose is war fighting. It should be war fighting all the time. Uh, that's, that's usually when the unit is tightest and most efficient and the Marines will, will, will do anything to, uh, to accomplish what needs to be done. But when it's not clear because commander's intent isn't clear because, uh, there's some there's some unnecessary ambiguity in what what expectations are. Or that's when the unfairness and all that stuff may start to emerge that that is unnecessary and and uh, and and unproductive. Yeah, just thinking about you know what the comment that you made about hey every ninety days we had a new set of you know lance corporals and PFCs come in and you know, one of the things that I had to do as a pilot is I had to kind of change. Not necessarily how I spoke, but, you know, I knew that, you know, one crew chief would respond one way to the way we were doing things. Another crew chief might respond a different way. So kind of like uh, with education, everybody sort of learns differently. Uh, I think, you know, my personal belief is everybody uh, can be led differently. Everybody needs to be needs to be led uh, differently. So, you know, what were some of the challenges that you faced as you as you had to sort of innovate and adapt your leadership style, you know, as you get, went from, you know, not just company command to battalion command, because you kind of spoke about the differences but the tw between the two, but how you had to deal with folks, you know, the different Marines and, and a leadership style that you needed, you know, differently uh, with different Marines. Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, what you might be getting as uh, generation changes and things like that also that um, I think uh, uh, Mr. Lee, just just kind of asked a question that may be along the lines of this as well. Uh, how how have I changed my my way of leading over the years? And uh, I'll say that uh, the, one of the things I've I've really tried to to get better at, and I've, I've seen uh, you know great rewards from is is giving Marines the individual love and attention that they deserve. And I, I learned this from a couple of great leaders who I want to call out here right now. Uh, one is uh, General Turner. Uh, who, when he was Lieutenant Colonel Turner, uh, he he took units out to CAX years ago when we used to call it CAX. And I uh, I got this story actually from one of the CAX observers. He told me that the two best battalions he ever saw come through CAX in the, in the two or three years he was there were both Lieutenant Colonel Turner's battalions. And I said, well, what, what did he do that was different that made his unit so great? He said, the only thing I could notice he did was he never held formations. Every correction and every piece of feedback and every interaction that he had with Marines and his battalions were on an individual level. I thought that was amazing. I'd never even heard of that. Uh, since the basic school and, and OCS and everything else, we learned that formations are the way to pass word, to establish a command presence, to emerge as a strong leader in front of large groups of people and establish confidence. General Turner, who is one of the finest leaders our Corps has ever seen has has done this individually. And you know who else does this is our acting commandant, General Smith. Uh, I, I got the great chance to serve under him at 1st Marine Division. Um, you know, every time I interacted with him, I felt like I was the most important person in his world. He knows how to make Marines feel great about themselves. He remembers everything about everyone he interacts with, which is amazing. And and I, I never saw him hold a formation at First Marine Division either. Um, he uh, he was he he he's tremendous at that. So I in my own command uh, practice, I try to spend one hour not try to spend I do spend one hour individually with a Marine every morning from zero eight to zero nine, and I did this in every command that I've been in, and uh, dedicate that one hour to individual attention for the Marine. Make sure that they're in an environment where they're being they're uh, they understand what's expected of them. They're they're able to be productive. They know what adding value to the organization means. 
they are under a clear supervisory structure. They know who their boss is. They know what their boss expects. And then lastly, what their personal goals are and what I could do to help them achieve them. And, and I try to keep my word whenever they'd ask me for something, a letter, a nomination, uh, they want to go to college, whatever it may be, I, I personally try to be of assistance uh, in that goal. Um, and I think it, it really helps culture out a lot. And um, it helps it helps out uh, young Marines. And, and you might say, well, that, that's really great and that's really necessary for the, the youngest generation that we have today. You know what? I think it was really necessary for every generation that we've had. But we're finally learning today that this is how you treat people uh, and, and get the most out of them. I, I see more and more leaders doing this every day, particularly in the general officer ranks. And, uh, and I'm really inspired to, uh, to, to see that it, this, oh, but I want to say, this does not imply, you know, relaxation of standards or any sense that an individual is more important than the unit. Uh, but it does imply that individuals matter and it, they do, and they always have, and that, uh, leaders owe them the love and attention that they deserve. And uh, that kind of made me think about another question, you know, so you're talking about, you know, General Turner and General Smith not having, you know, formations. But, you know, I remember growing up and always being told, like, hey, never give up an opportunity to talk to you or Marines. And it sort of sounds like not, they weren't necessarily giving up the opportunity to talk to all of their Marines at once. They were still taking that opportunity to talk to their Marines. They were just finding a different way uh of doing it uh because i don't think i've ever met a, a marine anywhere that enjoys formation so the idea of, of of being in a unit that just doesn't hold formation but the commander still interacts with all of his all of their marines sounds pretty fantastic to me you know i i uh i was i, I won't take full credit for thinking through all this this way i also was in command of comm school during covid where we couldn't have formations and so uh you know, I already kind of had some of these thoughts in my mind and it, it just kind of worked itself out during that time. I, I turned, I think we had one, one battalion formation the entire time I was there and it was towards the end. Uh, but I, I never, um, I never went back to that. I, I, I really enjoyed the individual attention uh, much more. And I, I think the Marines did as well. Yeah. And then my second question, you, you talked about, Hey, eight to nine, you would spend an hour with Marines and then you would always try and to, you know, Whatever you promised, you would try and give that back. How do you balance that with your own time management and being able to to do the things that you needed to do in order to make sure that you were 100%, you know, that kind of that that self-care to make sure that you were able to give 100% to the Marines. You have to make sure that you are 100%. So how do you balance that as a leader? Yeah, that some people have asked me that before and I'll say um that 8 to 9 thing probably benefited me more than the Marines every day. I mean, I know, I think most of them enjoyed it. I think, I don't know, you could ask them if you want, maybe they hated it, uh, but uh, I enjoyed it more. And that was part of my self, uh, self-preservation. I needed that. I needed individual time Marines. Uh, I, I love being around Marines. You know, I, people, people ask me, uh, I, I joined because of 9-11, but I, I stayed because of Marines. If I'm not around Marines, that's, that's when I start to get messed up. And I start to be a, a bad person, but when I'm around Marines, I'm, I'm good. So that's there. But also, you know, I told you before, I'm, I'm really reliant on my team to, uh, to take care of the mission. I'm probably one of the most reliant, uh, leaders in the Marine Corps on, on, on his Marines or her Marines. Um, and so, you know, my Marines, they, they do most of the execution level work that needs to be done. If in battalion command, if it didn't have to do with legal or admin, um, I was generally only involved in planning or assessing planning being, uh, you know, ensuring culture and climate was right. Number one, first and foremost thing. And secondly, some, some amount of operational planning as well. And then assessing is, is walking around and making sure that we are, that our plan is accomplishing the mission. But when it came to execution itself, that and then Com Training Battalion, that's in the classroom. Um, my role there was to uh, spend time in in classroom every day, two or three hours in 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 uh, in instructors' classrooms, observing them. And I'd say ninety nine percent of the time they impressed me, and I made that well known to them and and often to their students as well. And I think that helped uh, 
that help culture and climate. And then that, that helps. I mean, if that's all I got to do all day, uh, it's, it's a good job. It's a great job. And, and I don't need any more self care than that. I love, I love that, that job every, every day I'd come to work. I was pretty enthusiastic to, uh, to be there and, and be around the Marines and any of the stuff that was going to stress me out or, or work me hard. My, my team took care of it for me. They're, they're, they're the best team. Best one of the best teams you could ever have in Marine Corps. Yeah, I think, you know, we could get into topics of conversation like introverts and extroverts and where you kind of draw energy. Um, you know, that eight to nine does sound great, but for me as a, as an introvert, I think I would need nine to 10 just to, kind of, you know, get, get some of that energy back. You know, there's, a, I'm, I'm going to have to take it after this as well. Like I enjoy talking to folks, but I just, it's not where I draw, draw my energy. So I, I think, you know, folks, when they're about to go into leadership roles, sort of have to think about that, you know, where do I, where do I get my energy? How do I take care of myself? Because if I can't take care of myself, I can't take care of my Marines. I can't lead my Marines. So it's kind of a, an interesting dilemma to be in, uh, especially as a leader, because you kind of have to be you present, you know, kind of what you're talking about. And I think um, Albert's question, I think leads into the the last topic. And I, and I kind of, this is the topic I, I kind of want to get, get into here at the end, because it was one that we had a great conversation on the phone together. So uh, so Albert's question is, is uh, what sort of generational shifts have you seen with the Marines you've trained and possibly just important what hasn't changed? I know you and I on the phone talked about, hey, you know, when we were kids, the Internet wasn't a thing or it was a thing, but it was at the university or, you know, a DOD thing. You know, we really didn't get the Internet until you know we were seniors in high school going into college. And that's where really the Internet became a thing. But, you know, the Marines that are coming in now uh they've they've been on the internet their whole lives right you know we got the TikTok generation and the youtube generation you know and these folks that have been not necessarily glued to it but you know you know we come from a time where you had to if you if you wanted to, to know the secrets in a nintendo game you had to buy a strategy guide and now i can just google it so, you know coming from a different time so you know have you seen generational shifts from your time you know, joining the Marine Corps to, you know, those PFCs and Lance Corporals coming in now, you know, what's, what's different, what stayed the same? And do you think that presents leadership challenges as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too, Kiwi. So, you know, the, the texting generation or whatever you want to call them and, and all that that goes with it uh, brings its obvious challenges to a, uh, to a military environment. And folks that uh, young, young, young Marines who have, not spend a whole lot of time uh, communicating with other folks face to face uh, like we did growing up and, and done most of it over virtual means are are going to be challenged with with uh, with interactions um, and and we see plenty of that in, in the comm school every day uh, and I, we see that more and more among young Marines the young Marines that that come to us today are obviously use have used virtual marine means for communication uh, you know since they were born and uh, and a lot of them have not had the same kind of face-to-face uh, -face interaction and, and friendships that, that you and I had growing up. And, and we see challenges of that. Uh, I think any Marine leader out there right now, at least, at least of our age group, will understand that um, that can create difficulties for, for young Marines. Uh, but I think more important than that uh, is that our Marines today come from a more diverse and heterogeneous background, I think, than they ever have before. And that is wonderful and outstanding and brings great things to our organization that, that are obvious, new ways of thinking, new ideas, innovation. Uh, and and you'll, you, you just have to be in the Marine Corps for, for half an hour to know where all the great ideas are coming from right now to make the Marine Corps better. They're, they're coming from our young folks uh, through innovation challenges and things like that. And that's great. But what we have to remember as leaders is what wins wars is homogenous organizations that are laser focused on war fight. And so today we have Marines that, uh, you know, may have never shot weapons before, never gone camping, never played sports, uh, never been on sports teams or, or disciplined outfits like that. And maybe 20, 30 years ago, that was, that was somewhat common for, for, uh, folks that were joining the military to have done those kinds of things. I'll be the first to admit, I am one of these people who, before I joined the Marine Corps, had, had never shot a weapon, or really gone camping, 
terrible at sports, didn't exercise much, blah, blah, blah. And I came into a culture that, uh, that held my hand and, and made me uh, the okay Marine that I am today. And I'm, I'm super proud of that and forever thankful for all the leaders that tolerated me and, and mentored me and all the staff and CEOs that put up with me uh, for the last two decades to make me who I am today. But it takes leaders like that, tons more of them and tons more that are focused today than ever to take this heterogeneous culture of young Marines and turn them into this homogenous war fighting unit that we need to win near peer battles. Uh, and it, it so, so what that means is nothing goes without saying anymore, for instance. You can't just assume uh, people understand things or you and them came from the same background, so everything's gonna be the same and, and clarity's gonna be there and everything that's said. Crystal clear commander's intent, uh, five paragraph orders, all that stuff super important to making sure Marines understand what's supposed to be done and what's expected of them. And then the commander that cares, that gets out of his office and walks around and assesses the performance of those Marines every day and tries to really instill that culture, culture being what is normal in the unit, establishing those norms so that everyone kind of just understands what normal is. So the commander, the leaders don't have to be around all the time, but it takes energy takes a lot of energy and takes a lot more energy than it probably ever has in the past. And uh, I think that uh, we, we as, as, uh, as leaders need to understand that. And when we can do that, when we can take a heterogeneous culture of people with innovative and new ideas and turn them into a homogenous war fighting unit, uh, we'll be the best war fighting unit the world's ever seen in, in, in world history. I, I'm, I'm sure of it, but, uh, we need to continuously work hard to uh, to get to that standard. So I think that'll lead us into you know our our last question. I think you know we don't, we don't have a lot of time, so we can't get back in, into the back and forth that we had, uh, you know, you and I on the phone. But talking about you know uh, as we get into talent management, we've had discussions about hey, you know, there's been you know rumors about it, you know we'll let folks come in and they don't have to go to boot camp or you know, they'll come in and they'll just be a staff sergeant for X amount of time uh, because we want somebody with these uh, skill sets. Um, I, I think, you know, they've come out and said, hey, that's, you know, folks are going to go to boot camp uh, and all, all kinds of, you know, the, the things that make Marines Marines, you know, we're going to continue to do those things. Um, you know, and I've heard people say like, hey, in order to be a Marine, you've got to go to OCS or you have to go to boot camp and finish the crucible. And, you know, I, I, I look at those people and I was like, well, I, I did not go to boot camp. I did not do the crucible uh, and I did not go to OCS because I'm a Naval Academy graduate. So does that mean that I am not a Marine because I didn't do those things? So how do you, how do we define, you know, what, what makes a Marine, but how will, you know, that will obviously create leadership challenges if we change the culture by, you know, how we create Marines. So what kind of leadership challenges do you think we might see in that case? We, we've had a lot of conversation about culture today. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kiwi. So, you know, I guess we could kind of back up and just talk about talent management and, and its intent first off. And I think when it, when prescribed per its intent, per what it's designed to do, uh, it smartly employs Marines where they will be most successful and can aid in war fighting. Uh, and it, it allows Marines to be, uh, you know, have some level of self determination, control over their future. Uh, when they do good things and, and do things that are that are high performing, they're they're rewarded for their performance in in ways that matter to them through uh, through preferred PCS or uh, you know enhanced promotion or MOSs that fit their skill sets or things like that. I think all that makes perfect sense, and uh, and, it, and it makes it makes war fighting right. Uh, but I've I've heard unfortunately I've heard I've heard leaders in the Marine Corps. Talk about talent management as a, as a way to, to keep Marines out of the FMF or, uh, you know, forego their development as, as leaders. And I, I understand that, uh, you know, there's different types of leadership out there and things like that. But I think in a, in a general sense, uh, we are an expeditionary general purpose force that requires physically fit, versatile operators and leaders at every echelon of command. And if we aren't working hard to build that uh, in every Marine, or at least give them the opportunity, the opportunity to be leaders um, and see if they can you know, succeed or, 
or not in the in those roles. Um, I don't know if we're, we're we're doing what talent management intends uh, for for us. Uh, you know, we owe our Marines a Marine Corps experience uh, while placing them in billets to best support the institution, and I, I think we can do both. Um, to to your point, though, I think, you know, what what the the biggest talk right now about uh, pulling folks from uh, from previous skill sets are, are cyber marines, space marines, and uh, and that 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 makes that makes sense. You you have to have years of uh, of uh, cyber uh, background to be a capable cyber marine in either defensive or uh, particularly offensive cyberspace operations and. You have to be the same for offensive and, and defensive space control. And, uh, and so you have to have some experience to do that. And in order to be able to recruit folks that have that experience, we have to pay them properly. We have to give them opportunities that, 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 uh, that they look forward to. And, and we have to give them the Marine Corps experience that, that, uh, that, 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 that they want. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't want to join the Marine Corps. Um, and this is this is all hard to balance, really, really hard to balance, and I understand that. Uh, but I think that if we if we remember to keep thinking of it that way, and knowing that there's a balance that's required, uh, we're going to be fine. And this culture is is going to be be the the Marine Corps culture forever. And it's going to be the culture that we remember and expect from Marines, and what Joe Q taxpayer expects from Marines also. Uh, but if we we kind of avoid uh, the fact that all of these aspects need to be balanced, and we we go off and focus on one particular one, uh, that's when that's when I think we'll start to have either issues in the proficiency of those Marines, or uh, just not being focused on on the culture that we expect of Marines. Yeah, I think the one thing that I would add from my own personal experience is, you know, just because we've done something for two hundred and thirty something years doesn't mean that we need to continue doing something for two hundred and thirty years. Uh, you know, I saw a great joke on social media where a guy was like, hey, I was a battalion command. I saw two guys guarding a, a, a bench and they were just like, oh, well, the last battalion commander said we had to guard this bench. And so he goes back, he talks to the last battalion commander. He's like, well, the battalion commander before me just had two guys uh, guarding this bench. You know, he works back and he figures out that there's some retired general who commanded that battalion in 1950. And he called up that battalion commander and said, hey, I've got these two guys guarding the bench. Why are they there? And the, you know, the retired general's response was, is the paint not dry yet? You know, so this kind of idea that, you know, we do things because we've always done them, but we haven't really reviewed why we continue to do them. So it might be worth the, you know, as we, as we look at the things that we need to do, are the things we're doing now, are we doing them for the right reasons? And do we still know that the, the reason why we're doing things and we're not just doing them because it's the way that we've always done them. I think it's worth a look you know, and I think that's upsetting to people because, you know, if guarding that bench for the last 70 years was important, you know, we wouldn't have been guarding the bench. But if we're not guarding the bench for the right reasons, do we really need to continue guarding the bench per se? Um, but I, you know, I want to draw all this together with the, with the last couple of minutes that we have. And I think, uh, you know, culture, I feel like has been the, the stream of you know, the common thread through all of our, our comments today is, you know, if you can build the right culture, and that is your challenge as a leader, is building the culture within your unit that makes it the best unit. And so uh, I do want to throw it over to you, sir, for any closing comments that you you might have uh, as we as we come to the end of our of our time. Yeah, thanks, Kiwi. I, I, uh, I just really thank you for allowing me to, to be on the cast today and and speak of my of my thoughts. Um, I, I love being a Marine, obviously, and uh, I hope they'll let me be a Marine forever. Probably not, but uh, but I, I I I I enjoy I enjoy wearing this uniform every day. I'm especially proud to wear it today on 9/11, and uh, and and I, I'm I'm really thankful to be able to do this podcast today. So thank you. Okay. Uh, and thank you, uh, sir, for coming on today and sharing your thoughts uh, and letting me share some of mine as well. Uh, and thank you to all the folks who joined us today in the chat. Um, that's all we have for today. Uh, so go ahead and carry out the plan of the day. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Crew Lack community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. 
Also, if you have enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support, and we'll see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.